Welcome to this webinar on the role of diplomacy in preserving peace in Central Asia by Her Excellency Rosa Otumbayeva, former president of the Kyrgyz Republic. Your Excellency, it's a great honor to have you with us today. Before we start, please allow me a brief introduction into this webinar. My name is Axel Marx, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Luther Center for Global Governance Studies. Kyrgyzstan is one of the former Soviet republics that are about to celebrate their 30 year anniversary of independence. Kyrgyzstan is also a country that used to be known as the Central Asian's island of democracy, thanks to its free market reforms and political pluralism. However, repeated crises have led to mounting internal and external, external tensions. Recent border conflicts with Tajikistan, as well as the constitutional change from parliamentary to presidential republic and ongoing political turmoil have generated new challenges. These add to other broader challenges in Central Asia, such as the withdrawal of the US troops from Afghanistan and human rights concerns in Russia and China. These developments raise important questions on the role of the European Union's external action and international cooperation can play to ensure security and promote democracy and the rule of law. The case of Kyrgyzstan is illustrative how rapidly democracy can backslide threatening peace and security in a wider region. Kyrgyzstan's case is also em emblematic of the challenges the EU faces in terms of the effectiveness of aid aimed at peace building and the promotion and consolidation of democratic values. These developments and insights into these developments are crucial for several research projects we are conducting at the Louvre Center for Global Governance Studies. Allow me to briefly mention two, the H2020 project Reconnect and the H2020 project Engage. Reconnect is an EU funded Horizon 2020 project, which stands for reconciling Europe with its citizens through democracy and the rule of law. It brings together 18 academic institutions from 14 countries. Its aim is to understand developments with regard to the rule of law in the EU and its member states and explore ways to strengthen European democracy. Our primary focus is to understand factors and processes which lead to or sustain democratic and rule of law uh, values. Reconnect as a project is very much, of course, focused on the developments in the European Union. However, many of these developments we look at also play out in other countries around the world. And that's where we therefore decided to launch a series of webinars on democratic and rule of law backsliding causes, consequences, and prospects from around the world. The idea is to take stock of some of the major developments in specific countries and regions with regard to rule of law and democratic backsliding. And today's webinar, of course, fits very well within uh, this line of research and within this line uh, of, 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 of thinking. It's also very closely related to another project which we just started up and which is entitled ENGAGE. ENGAGE stands for a new governance architecture for a global Europe. It will run over three and a half years and the main aim is to advance goals that are aligned with the European Commission push to have a stronger and more united European voice in the world. The project will focus on how the EU both its institutions and its member states can effectively and sustainably harness all of its tools in a joined up external action, including its common foreign policy and its common security and defense. Engage brings together more than 15 universities and think tanks, and we are just embarking on this project. The importance for the EU to strengthen its external action was aptly described by <coughs> Joseph Borrell, the High Representative of the Union and uh, for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy and the Vice President of the European Commission. 
he and he addressed the Engage Consortium during its kickoff conference. And he noted very aptly that the most striking thing about the world today is speed. In the world of threats and power politics, the EU, the EU needs to stick together and go faster. Our future influence will depend on our capacity to deliver now. And for this, we need a common strategic culture in Europe, a common assessment of threats and a shared understanding of the world. <clears throat> the importance of speed is also exemplified by the quick changes in regimes and political circumstances which are currently playing out in Central Asia. Reflecting on these developments and what the EU can do is the focus of today's talk. We are extremely honored and privileged to reflect on these questions with Rosa Otambayeva. Rosa Otambayeva is the former president of the Kyrgyz Republic, member of the group of high level advisors on mediation under the UN Secretary General, and a member of the Madrid Group. She is also the founder of an initiative and foundation which carries her name, the Rosa Otambayeva Initiative which supports and implements projects aimed at promoting democratic governance, women and youth empowerment and education, and sustainable development. Her Excellency will first talk for 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll take questions. If you have any questions for today's speaker, please feel free to send your questions at any time during the talk in the Q&A box. The talk with Her Excellency will be moderated by my colleague, Nazik Pashinali, who is also a native from the Kyrgyz Republic and an expert in the field. Do not forget, if you have any questions, feel free to send them to us. Now it's my great pleasure and honor to hand over to Nazik and Her Excellency. Thank you, Axel, for this um, great introduction and all your support for organizing this important event. My name is Nezik Bishnale, I'm a researcher at K11. I had a chance to work under the leadership of Rosa Tumbaeva when after my PhD in France, I returned to Kyrgyzstan to work in policy research system. And I could witness from my own eyes uh, the tremendous work she's been conducting on the ground. I'm therefore particularly delighted to be welcoming Rosa Tumbava, the former president of the Kyrgyz Republic for today's conversation. Axel uh, has already introduced um, Her Excellency. I would just like to add that uh, Rosa Tumbava is the first woman president in Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia. It exemplifies how much Kyrgyz value women, women leadership. In the 19th century already, Datka, the queen of Alai, also a diplomat, was one of the rare women uh, rulers in the histories of uh, Muslim societies. Rosa Tumbawa is a world-renowned politician, diplomat, a great leader who has a rare ability to listen, connect, and empower. For Kyrgyz uh, people, especially for the young generation, she is a symbol of courage and hope. I'm confident that this con conversation with Her Excellency will contribute to make Central Asia and Europe one step closer, provided that today, especially in today's post-COVID world, the distance is defined less by geography, but by the common set of values. Please uh, write your uh, questions in the Q&A box. I will monitor them and try to pick as many as I can. Without further ado, I... Uh, hands the screen to uh, Her Excellency Rosa Tumbaeva. I would like to thank the global. Uh, Governance Center of the University of Leuven and the Reconnect Engage Project Consortium for this opportunity to discuss the challenges of Kyrgyzstan. Eurasia is the center of the world, and who controls Eurasia controls the world, wrote once in his book, well, The Grand Chessboard, Zbigniew Brzezinski. Indeed, 
most of the empires of the world have been striving for Central Asia since Alexander the Great. But our people who fought against Alexander and others never had wars between themselves. Conflicts, yes, but not wars. Central Asia is a region where people have learned diplomacy for centuries. Being at the heart of Silk Road University for millennia. The region's uniqueness also in its complementarity and geographical interdependence. However, today we live in a rapidly changing world which also transforms the character of conflicts. We can observe new alerting signs that require concerted diplomatic efforts for preserving peace. These signs include escalating character, hybrid nature, vigor, and extent of this impact it has on the lives of civilians. All this happens in the context of the increasing scarcity of natural resources and uncertain impacts of climate change. Diplomacy must play fundamental role in the development and prosperity of all countries in the region. Recent border conflicts are consequence of the years of accumulated internal problems. This situation legitimately questions our internal governance choices, but also in broader terms, the efficacy of development, including international programs and policies. Kyrgyzstan has always valued this support. My country, one of the pioneers of democratic state building and adhered full heartedly to its underlying principles. We have been the first in implementing market reforms, first to enter the WTO, first to introduce the parliamentary democracy. And now we are also one of the first to experience how everything can quickly backslide and how fragile peace can be. From inside and outside, we hear criticism that all our work was just an experiment to prove that democracy does not work. I, I don't agree. I believe that democracy works as a result we have today an active political life. Our society searches the support of the European Union and other democratic partners. We have a very dynamic civil society, strong media, and most importantly, generation of educated professionals who tirelessly train hundreds of new NGOs who conduct journalist investigations at the risk and perils, who bring their knowledge and expertise, and who speak up. I think this is a priceless result of our combined efforts of the two last decades. However, there are not so many. Long way to go ahead. Democratic values represent for the local communities textbook concept that hardly passes through the shield of local narratives. Not because people reject it, mostly because that there is no epistemological space for welcoming rights and liberties as a value. We need to create it using the tools of research-based communication. Diplomacy is communication above all. A complex communication in an international scene for peace and prosperity. Today, diplomatic communication involves international agencies, businesses, civil society, individuals who are evolving toward becoming 
diplomatic actors in their own right, as they face many of the same challenges as government actors. Therefore, I would like to discuss the opportunities for our countries and for the European Union external action at three different levels. First, at the interstate level. The recent conflicts, uh, border conflict, has another distinguished feature. It almost fully relied on the interstate mechanisms of conflict resolution and interregional mediation. Many criticized existing platforms for mediation, but neither uh, China nor Russia, either US, none of them, they interfered to our uh, area. And uh, uh, although each of them, they have uh, great interests uh, to, um, to, to impact uh, on our countries, but uh, because uh, uh, we don't have this practice and they didn't uh, uh, interfere. So there is, uh, 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 today, of course, we have uh, um, uh, increasing consensus that in order to escape fragility, the solution must be home grow. The conflict has its deep roots and requires series of as for the management of borders, natural resources, agricultural land, and many other. This requires specialized institutions with trained professionals on border issues, and also legal, environmental, climate experts, engineers, and so on. As of today, there is no institu institutionalized platform for Central Asian regional cooperation. Like ASEAN, like many such organizations in Africa, in Latin America. In Central Asia, we have little experience of intra-regional diplomacy. It was time when uh, uh, we, we uh, alliance organization. Even recently, when uh, President of Uzbekistan Mirziyev came to his uh, post, he enthusiastically started to talk about Central Asian Union. In the uh, European global strategy, we read and you state that European Union will support cooperative regional orders worldwide and that you will invest in regional orders and in cooperation among and within regions. We need your expertise for building our intra-regional dialogue. Central Asia offers great terrain to implement the European Union global strategy as we also strive to learn from your unique experience of building supranational public service and institutions. For this, we would indeed need strong and accountable institutions, which is a part of the European Union Central Asia strategy. The region has more in common than divides, for sure. More importantly, it shares another area for shared interest. It is common future. Central Asia, on top of a range of shared history, language, culture, shares today common challenges, ensuring the regional security and reducing the risk of radicalization, addressing economic development challenges, addressing the issues of climate change and the environmental damage, ensuring geopolitical dialogue and cooperation, increasing regional trade, and 
Second level, the rise of global even policies, public opinion, and can positively or negatively contribute to peace and stability. To me, it is an opportunity for addressing the old day narratives through social and cultural exchanges between youth, businesses, between rural producers for building sustainable value chains, reflecting together on novel solutions that are aligned to our new environmental and climate commitments. We are therefore looking forward to the Green Deal playing an important role in enhancing connectivity and strengthening economic cooperation. Central Asia still lags behind other regions of the world in terms of compliance with sustainability certification and standards, which hinder the access to the world trade flows. Why do I think this is so important? Take the issue of water. If before water supply was simply an issue of contention leading to conflict over how to divide water supplies in the future, the question will be much more fundamental. How will we ensure that there is enough water to divide so that all countries in the region get at least the minimum required for populations and agriculture? Today in Central Asia, it is the most acute issue. How we can transform the way we use water so that we use it as economically as possible. So far, Central Asian countries, including my country, are not paying much of an active role in climate discussions. But it is time for, for us to join the discussions on how to meet the needs of a growing population under conditions of climate change. This is not just a question of aid, although aid will be necessary. Unless my country and others in the region focus on what their future investment needs will be, for example, investing in training the workforce to produce new technologies, or solar energy panels, or cleansing, uh, cleaning up the environmental mess left at mining uh, sites, or installing water uh, conserve uh, pipes and agriculture, and begin to think more deeply about the rational use of natural resources, including reducing the reliance on, on fossil fuels, when the European Union may find ourselves speaking past each other. This would be a huge missed opportunity for both of us. Ideally, Countries in my region will start talking among themselves about regional solutions to global problems. And ideally, the European Union will be our partner. You have the experience and the expertise, and we need both. It may be too much to imagine now, but perhaps in the not too distant future, the issues that divided the Kyrgyz Republic from its neighbors will become a factor that brings us together. It happened in Europe. And watching your united front, especially on these very important issues of climate change and sustainability, perhaps it is time to think that it can happen in my region as well. The third level, is uh, uh, this is um, at the interstate level? Uh, sorry, this is uh, on individual level. So I, uh, I do believe that. Uh,
And what that was so important. I can fight my foot. Individual level. In the era of digital technologies, individuals impact public opinion beyond the borders of their countries. This also uncovers our vulnerabilities and increasingly fragmented identities. At this level, the role of youth and women is particularly important. We know that a women's agency leads to the more effective utilization of natural and human resources. And now, and how much they contribute to peace building. However, we still need to identify ways of how not losing this critical juncture momentum when we still can drive our societies towards positive social changes and cohesion. We are talking about the backsliding, but uh, uh, other day, we, all of us in Kyrgyzstan have been so happy when we learned that uh, uh, the number of uh, uh, deputies uh, in local um, uh, governments rose four times more than five years ago. This real, really big change. Central Asia remains an underexplored phenomenon. It hardly exists on the map of academic research. This explains the deficit of informed and evidence-based policy making. Building academic and research linkages is crucial to de develop adapted policy measures, addressing the issues of the development of the region. Peace is global public good. Therefore, we are open and willing to cooperate with the European research and academic community to understand better our society, identities, and underlying issues, learning from your methods and concepts while facilitating and supporting your work with locally available resources. With the work of my foundation, I travel extensively to remote regions of Kyrgyzstan. We conduct a range of educational and women empowerment projects in collaboration with local and international development partners. Meeting women and men who live in the villages, I can see how quickly our society is changing. Providing civic and secular education is becoming more and more challenging in the context of mounting radicalization and difficult access of people to basic services and goods. I also see how the hard earned democratic achievements of the past two decades can quickly backslide. As never before, we realize the preciousness of time at this exact moment. We are losing generations of people in many fold identity pockets that promote different sets of values than the democracy and the human rights. But uh, hope is strong in my country. I do see a lot of young people striving to democracy, exercising democratic rules, rule of law, behavior. And I do believe in the bright future of my country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. It was an amazing contribution and very enlightening uh, speech. I see um, there are already a few questions that are coming in our um, q and I will be reading them out one by one. We have still 30 minutes left. Um, let me thank you once more for this, um, uh, for your uh, presentation and I noted for myself that your um, um, mention that time is precious uh, resonates with a piece of uh, uh, quotation that Axel mentioned in the beginning about the speed. So I think that's um, a, a very important point uh, in fact. So let me start with the first question, um, how important is the role of economic diplomacy and how much do economic interests influence political decisions? So I believe it's in relation 
uh, to Central Asian um, uh, context. Thank you. Uh, economic diplomacy is a vital part of our uh, diplomacy. I think uh, of, uh, you would see on the surface of diplomacy in uh, exercising in Central Asia. This is really economic diplomacy. Every uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and uh, of the uh, directed choice uh, with other countries uh, present wide embassy outside. I, I'm sure that in the, every Central Asian country, the picture is the same. They are uh, uh, tasked to bring investment. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the whole uh, range of uh, ties, institutions. There are a lot of uh, activity, uh, all sorts of conferences, all sorts of uh, uh, exhibitions, uh, which every country exercises. So I would just respond positively on this stage. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, I think um, economic, I, I just can add that economic diplomacy is indeed very important factor as well in peace building. So let me uh, switch to the second question, um, which is uh, asking actually, what uh, can the EU do to strengthen civil society in Central Asia? I think you are the right person to know the answer to this question. Would you repeat again what the uh, European yes. Union do? What? what can the European Union do to strengthen civil society in Central Asia? I think every country has uh, her own uh, situation and own problems. Uh, uh, it's widely known that the civil society is the strongest in my country. But I would uh, say that uh, civil society still needs a lot of support and encouragement. Uh, uh, yes, uh, they are very strong uh, in the capital city and uh, they are well trained, uh, they have good capacity, but uh, civil society in oblast, uh, uh, in the regions, uh, uh, needs much more attention. Unfortunately, still we need a lot of uh, uh, such uh, financial support uh, for their activity, especially when you have all sorts of such a uh, um, situation like uh, disasters, conflicts. Uh, these days, uh, a lot of support uh, goes uh, to Batken region where we had uh, uh, this uh, uh, border conflicts and uh, civil society can reach those uh, places which government can't reach. Uh, we are talking about the help to women, to children, to vulnerable people. So uh, civil society uh, on, on such a civil side, let's say on uh, general humanistic side, it always needs financial material support. Uh, civil society on the side of uh, of human rights, uh, they need uh, constant training. And uh, um, I would say that our civil society in Kyrgyzstan is uh, quite, uh, um, how to say, uh, they are uh, in, in good shape and uh, they would lead uh, public discussion they would never uh, be in silence when we have uh, some urgent and serious problem. Uh, but uh, I think uh, generally they need uh, uh, every time support. New governments who come to the uh, power, they not always appreciate uh, uh, civil society's uh, presence, uh, their strength. 
and uh, I just regret uh, yesterday our parliament passed the law on NGOs um, that uh, NGOs should be under more strict scrutiny of their financial um, and uh, their uh, their material side of, of NGOs. So uh, this is uh, what we have today. Thank you very much. Um, it's indeed a very acute question, not only for Kyrgyzstan and for many of Central Asian countries. Let me uh, combine a few questions that are coming because they are more or less the same uh, subject. So that uh, would be regarding the recent conflict. So how do you see the recent conflict in the larger geopolitical con context? Do you see it as a local incident or somehow linked to larger series of events in, in the broader regions? And um, another question in, in, uh, linked to this is how to avoid that it, um, it, will, it can repeat itself. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my country didn't solve yet uh, border uh, for issues with uh, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. So uh, vice versa, those countries, uh, they have uh, the same problem uh, with uh, us and uh, as far as I know, uh, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan also, they have uh, border issues. So uh, we are talking about the border uh, issues in Ferganagar, the most populated uh, uh, such uh, uh, parts uh, uh, of the globe uh, and uh, tense populated uh, um, corner of the globe. Um, as uh, uh, successors of the Soviet uh, past, uh, we got uh, such a difficult uh, historical uh, terrain background, and uh, we must, uh, of course, uh, do this uh, uh, step by step, stretch by stretch, and uh, we were doing over the last 30 years. Uh, certainly, all these years have uh, been not quite. We had. Uh, uh, every time uh, problems and uh, um, it's uh, really uh, we live under such a quite a difficult circumstances but uh, uh, that's what I was uh, uh, addressing in my uh, uh, speech today that we badly need expertise we badly need technical expertise also we have our border uh, experts, but uh, it will be so important for us to learn uh, this experience from other parts of the world and uh, really to come to the solution. It is not an easy issue. Um, uh, regarding how to avoid, uh, it is uh, not easy. Uh, diplomacy works. Uh, for this unit, uh, uh, among the Central Asian countries, which I was talking about, uh, will be vital, important. We are in different sorts of uh, such uh, uh, alliances. Uh, uh, almost all Central Asian countries are part of uh, CIS, part of Shanghai Organization of Cooperation. We are part of other uh, international organizations, each of them. They have peace building and peacemaking as the highest priority, but still, uh, I think uh, such a focus way to uh, to try to solve this border issues problem is uh, it is not uh, uh, in their mandate, let's say, because uh, when we have security problems, we turn to some other organization which we are part of but they are also helpless, unfortunately. So uh, these issues, border issues, today they are mostly bilateral, uh, internal, inter-regional issues. And we are trying to uh, sort out uh, these uh, problems. Uh, uh, I guess I lost the um, focus of this uh, question. What was then? 
I, I think you answered the, the question. <laughs> you answered um, very well. Uh, so um, it leaves more floor to other uh, people to intervene with their question. So I think that is also, uh, there is a question which is um, uh, in, in directly in relation with your uh, diplomatic uh, past and you are, um, I think, uh, without any doubt, the, the best person to answer this question, at least for Kyrgyzstan. So uh, Central Asia is in between Europe, uh, Russia and China. Uh, from the perspective of the citizens in Central Asia, what is their main reference point in which are they most interested, EU, China or Russia? So it's uh, um, about uh, the multivectoral policy they have. So what right, would be right. mm -hmm. Yes. So um, uh, uh, what is the main reference uh, for the, um, from the perspective of the citizens of Central Asia, uh, which are, uh, what partnerships it envisage uh, to prefer EU, China or Russia? We used to live uh, in Euro-Asian and we live today in, in Euro-Asian context. So uh, as Asians uh, uh, before the collapse of USSR, it ended with our border with China, but China was closed for us. So I would say that uh, we learned about China uh, just during the last 30 years, more and more. And uh, uh, the most intensive way and the most active way China is today, of course, our serious big counterparts, uh, no doubt about this. Uh, Russia is still our strategic partner and uh, uh, our uh, uh, main uh, partner in international uh, and economical uh, relations. Uh, Europe, we know uh, directly now, uh, so we have uh, with the European Union uh, uh, agreements, uh, connections, uh, uh, a lot of projects, uh, uh, mostly uh, for my country, eight projects, uh, unfortunately, as I told you, especially we are interesting now with this uh, topic of Green Deal, which is uh, high agenda for the world uh, and uh, didn't uh, came uh, seriously and solidly to our soil. So uh, I think uh, we would be uh, interested very much in the European experience in many ways. When I was foreign minister, I uh, explored uh, the Council of Europe's uh, uh, heritage and uh, all of their possession. It's so rich and so important and so vital for uh, our uh, life. Uh, but uh, we are not a part of the Council of Europe. Uh, we, uh, we try to join to many other European uh, institutions. Uh, uh, I do believe that our ambassador is very active person there, Dr. Jumali. I hope that uh, he would do his best. Uh, we are not like Baltic countries or Moldova or uh, other uh, uh, pro-European countries uh, close to Europe. So uh, we badly need European experience, uh, uh, but uh, we live in our uh, geographical juncture and enjoy this. Uh, uh, situation. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Excellency. I think you are raising very important um, issue here um, as to, um, uh, what defines our identities, whether it is bound to our geographical uh, region or to the values. And in your presentation, you made it clear that by our values, we are very much close to the democratic values of um, of the European Union. Uh, also, we are uh, a, a bit in a distance, but we value um, uh, the support and all the uh, potential collaboration with them. Thank you. Um, I uh, switched I think to you have a, a, a you, um, Nazi, 
Yes. You have uh, such a, a wrong uh, person. I'm the person who is very much pro-European. <laughs> I'm the person who uh, has a label to be thought about uh, pro-Europe uh, uh, direction. Uh, but uh, my nation is uh, a sort of more uh, conservative and uh, uh, every time uh, hints that, look, we have uh, Asian background, we must uh, stay in Asia and uh, raise our national identities and uh, bring to the uh, scene all of what we have possessed from our history and tradition. Thank you. I, I think that's a, a very interesting, actually, topic for, for potential research. Uh, and I think it also allows me to transit to the next question, which is a bit linked to, to, to what you were saying. Uh, Veronique Holman asks, uh, regional collaboration and regional platforms, institutions, what are the entry points? Do you think that countries in the region are ready to move in this direction? To, uh, to build a Central Asian Union? I think so. <laughs> we are ready. ready and uh, there is a, yeah, there is a, no uh, uh, political will and leadership to my mind. So. Uh, we had, unfortunately, such a rivalry between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, who is uh, the more uh, stronger in, in the region. Uh, Today, uh, Mr. Nazarbayev is not anymore president of Kazakhstan, who was heavyweight. Uh, of, uh, I recently gave an interview about uh, President Tokayev, and I do believe he's very high intellectual, and uh, uh, he can lead uh, certainly as intellectual Central Asia. And I mentioned uh, President Mirziyoyev of Uzbekistan, who uh, as uh, soon as he became president, uh, he raised this issue of uh, Central Asian Union. And so all of us, we've been very happy to hear this. But unfortunately, uh, probably he was involved very much in the internal problems of uh, development of Uzbekistan and uh, uh, this issue uh, became sort of uh, quite marginal. And uh, every time Central Asian leaders, they come together, they raise this issue sometimes, and uh, uh, they, they have even uh, uh, such a, uh, gatherings, uh, every year gatherings, and uh, another one supposed to be in Turkestan, and uh, in, in Kazakhstan it didn't happen. So anyway, what I'm talking about, there is a lack of political leadership uh, to build such a Central Asian uh, uh, Union. And uh, I think uh, there is not enough uh, such a solid base uh, uh, to such a union. Yeah, thank you. Thank you um, for your uh, very detailed uh, uh, answer. So here is, a, I have a question about your work with your foundation. Uh, could you please uh, tell about the activities of your foundation? What are the biggest challenges you face on the ground when advocating for the values of democracy and the human rights? We have all the problems which uh, we have uh, within our country and um, uh, promotion of uh, uh, human rights, uh, uh, promotion of human uh, 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 promotion of generally such a values, progressive values. Uh, let's uh, talk about the women rights uh, and uh, let's uh, uh, talk about the children's rights. So 
My foundation works uh, quite intensively in the field uh, uh, of uh, children and uh, activity with the children and uh, activity with the women. Uh, just recently, we finalized uh, projects of STEM. Uh, education is deteriorated, certainly, in uh, uh, post-Soviet uh, countries, uh, um, my country especially, and uh, science, technology, math uh, subjects are uh, taught uh, not uh, very well. Uh, this uh, uh, online education, which is uh, regular now education, is uh, in difficulties because uh, teachers are not trained properly. There are uh, a lack of uh, uh, such a methodical uh, literature about this. Uh, uh, there is a lack of uh, computers and so on and so on. So, uh, and we must uh, train also uh, uh, parents. Uh, um, uh, training girls, this is a big problem. And uh, uh, generally situation of the girls and uh, women it needs a lot of attention. It needs a lot of support. So in Asian countries, I'm sure that uh, uh, everyone should understand this. Uh, children's uh, situation is uh, not better in the sense that parents, uh, they go abroad to work. Uh, migration is a huge problem in my country. I do believe that you understand well that migration is overall uh, in many countries, not just in Central Asia, but in Baltic countries also, it is a quite acute problem. But in my country, when you have uh, children, you leave them with their grandparents and uh, you go to work uh, to other countries and children, they need a lot of attention. Uh, uh, this is now summertime. And so during the summertime, we, uh, my uh, foundation uh, practices uh, uh, kindergartens on Jairo. Jairo, those are the uh, very high mountainous uh, um, places among the mountains where uh, our shepherds with their sheep and uh, a lot of children are there. And uh, I do believe that we should pay attention to those the most vulnerable to children of uh, less privileged people of those shepherds. And so during the summer, we bring their uh, school children, uh, teachers, uh, we bring their animators, uh, theater to teach them to do of many things. I have turned my response uh, to what we are doing, but uh, regarding the uh, rights, uh, human rights, and regarding these issues of uh, uh, promotion of uh, uh, progressive uh, behavior, this is really a lot of things to do in our party. Um, Your Excellency, we are um, uh, still having many questions, but unfortunately, our um, time is uh, coming. To, um, timing is being short, so we are we have only six minutes left. So maybe I'll pick up one last question for a very brief answer, which would be, um, which is probably difficult to answer briefly. How do you think the COVID has impacted the state of democracy in the region? Do you think? Uh, it has not impacted positively or negatively, or maybe you could evolve on that. Yes. <laughs> not sure, but negatively, sure. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm the commissioner of the Pan European Commission on COVID uh, preparedness to new challenges uh, uh, under the leadership of uh, uh, Mr. Mario Monti, who was Euro Commissar in the past and prime minister of Italy. So we are more than 20 of us uh, commissioners uh, and we are working on this report. Uh, 
uh, at the end of August or beginning of September to, to be released. Regarding COVID and its impacts on Central Asia, uh, I'm sure that it is negative. Uh, positive things, yes. Uh, for example, it was uh, such a great push to learn uh, for IT uh, technologies. Everyone, parents, children, teachers, all of them be supposed to learn IT because uh, uh, all the teaching, everything became online, uh, very hard uh, offline. So, uh, but negative sides uh, of exactly these days, this week's uh, uh, COVID is on uh, such a straight rise in, in my country, neighboring Kazakhstan. And so I just read yesterday, except Turkmenistan. Uh, sounds like really a unique place in this sense, but uh, all of us uh, on the globe, uh, in Europe, everywhere we have trouble with the rise of uh, COVID. Uh, um, joblessness, it is uh, such a, a, a negative uh, uh, impact, serious. Um, uh, today, I heard the news that uh, Russia, which uh, really has a great uh, a need for, uh, uh, for, for working uh, labor force, now they will start to bring uh, uh, workers from Central Asian countries by train, because the train was excluded for the uh, last uh, half, uh, half a year, almost a year. So uh, it, it was uh, uh, it was not in force. Uh, joblessness it is uh, the most serious. Uh, people lost their jobs. Uh, Thank new you. jobs. Uh, uh, it is uh, just you know in our part just uh, just just building IT specialist or uh, creative economy, which is now also on the agenda uh, um, of our handy crafters uh, and uh, all the people working at home. So uh, nevertheless, uh, this, uh, this is, uh, and today, unfortunately, big problem also, um, a problem of, of food uh, uh, today because of uh, so many people didn't work uh, so yes. long. Uh, this this became well, food safety uh, became also one of the serious. Thank you, uh, uh, Rosetta. So, thank you so, so uh, much. Matic, I understand my time is gone. Right? <laughs> thank you so much for your amazing uh, contribution, and I think it gives so much food of thought, uh, food for thought. And uh, I would like also to thank uh, um, Reconnect and Engage platform for this conversation. And I think with all the food of thought you 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 have given us, we are set up for a new project probably. Thank you so much. I hand the floor to uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Marx. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nazik. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for a wonderful and very interesting webinar. You started out by saying that uh, the Central Asian region is not very well understood and very well known. And uh, I think uh, that's an important observation, especially in Europe, we need to know more about what's going on and what's developing there. And I think you shed great light on key issues and recent developments there and some of the potential also avenues of addressing some of the major challenges. It was very insightful, very enriching. So thank you very much for joining us today. I would like to thank also Nazik for excellent moderation. I would like to thank the audience for the many, many questions we had. It was really uh, an excellent number of questions we got in and we had a great dialogue. So. I want to thank you all very much again for your contribution and for your attendance. Your Excellency, thank you very much for an excellent speech. I hope everybody online will keep on following us at Reconnect and Engage, and I wish you a very nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice thank day. You. you too.